When we come to the Bible and we look at these, we look at, we read the, gosp the Gospels and we, we read the stories and acts of the early church, um, it, it seems very far away, doesn't it? It seems very long ago when we think about Peter and John who were arrested for proclaiming the name of Jesus. That's all that they did. But when we look at the book of Acts, the book of Acts, in a very real sense, has not yet been finished. I know that in the Bible, what we read, that's the end of, the, of what is written and inspired of the Holy Spirit for our benefit. But brothers and sisters, the story, the Acts of the Apostles that finishes with chapter 28 in the Bible that you have is still being written today. It's still being written today. It's being written around the world. It's being written in countries around the world. It is being written here in Hong Kong. It's being written in your home countries today because the Acts of the Apostles, we are His followers. We are His disciples. They are not finished. They are not over. And God continues to give His Holy Spirit because the enemy continues to stand against and to oppose and because God's children and people throughout the ages until the end of time when the just judge Jesus comes to settle everything and to rule in justice and to deal with everything until then the acts of the apostles continue and you are part of that and I am part of that. And what we just saw this morning, Liana, she and her family are part of that as well. In North Korea this morning, this is still continuing. And God help us, God help us to live our Christian lives in such a way with that view and with that vision and with that power of the Holy Spirit day by day by day. I believe that as time goes on, I, I truly believe that much of what we see this morning, uh, please turn off, uh, turn off these lights, these lights right here. Um, I believe that what we see here is going to be seen more and more in other countries as well, not just uh, not just these countries where we say there's a lot of persecution in in Syria or in Central African Republic or in Somalia or in North Korea. Yes, those places now there's great persecution, but I do believe that as time goes on, I believe in the countries that many of us call home, there will be greater and greater opposition to the Lord. Jesus Christ and to his followers. And so we look at these things, and I encourage you this morning as we come to the conclusion of the series that I've been teaching, that we really allow, we pray for the persecuted church, and we want, and we've done that this Sunday, we want to keep that on our hearts, but that we recognize also that it's not just them and us, but it's us together, that we're all, we're all part of this and that the provision of the Lord is the same for each one of us. Amen? Amen. Amen. And so we come this morning to our conclusion. I think the Lord, I didn't know that this was how it would end this morning and with the, with the uh, ending, uh, with the International Day of Prayer for the Persecuted Church, I think the Lord arranged it. But we come this morning to our last, uh, to our last uh, message in the series, Power, Preaching, Persecution. And this morning we end with prayer. prayer. Prayer in the healing of the lame beggar. And so that's what we want to look at this morning. And um, may the Lord encourage us and bless us. And the Lord does when we give ourselves to His Word and we open our hearts to the leading and the teaching and the, uh, and the, the training and the correction of the Holy Spirit. We are indeed blessed. So we come this morning to the conclusion. If you have your Bibles, you know that we're in Acts chapters 3 and 4. And this morning we are starting in 
uh, will the most of the message will be from Acts chapter 4 23 to almost the end of the chapter so that's where we'll be focusing today as we come to the end of this I know you've been reading it so I know you know the end of the story already right um, but we look this morning and uh, as as we look at this I want to encourage you as long as as the Lord Jesus tarries and does not come back for his church, there will be a persecuted church. There will be a persecuted church. There was from the beginning. There has been through all the ages of mankind. There is now and there will continue to be. As long as there's an enemy, the devil, who hates God, and hates God's children, there will be a persecuted church. There will be opposition. And while that is true, I encourage you this morning, as we face perhaps not a lot of persecution and not a lot of opposition, nevertheless, I encourage you and I exhort you this morning, be of good cheer, Jesus says. I have overcome the world. I've overcome the world, and that is where we stand. I've overcome the world, and Jesus overcame the world not for himself, but for whom? For us, for the church. And I want us to look at this, the next slide. Jesus overcame through what? We have seen his perfect sinless and obedient life on this earth through his death, through his resurrection and his overcoming and his victory is applied to our lives through the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit at work. Now we've seen it in this story so as we go through this and we come to a conclusion today don't just look at Peter and John the great apostles from back then but this is for you and for me. It's not a history lesson for the sake of history. It's a history lesson for the sake of our lives. And we have seen the work of the Holy Spirit in power through the healing of the lame beggar. And this is the victory that Jesus won through overcoming the world. And because Jesus overcame the world, he could say all authority, he overcame the world, the flesh, the devil, sin, death, and hell. And because he overcame, he said to his disciples then and now, I have been given all authority. Now you go. And the authority that Jesus won and purchased is then passed to his children in this world. And we see it in the lives of Peter and John. And it is to be in our lives as well. So the victory of Jesus we see in power through the healing of the lame beggar. We have seen his work in and through Peter and John in the preaching the proclamation of the name of Jesus to the crowd. Brothers and sisters, intellectual wisdom and a high IQ. I, I know that there are some of us in this church that we're, we're probably geniuses. Some of you are probably geniuses if you've had your IQ tested before. You may be way up there. You may be way up there. But a high IQ and earthly wisdom and intelligence no matter how wonderful and no matter that if it is a gift from God and it is a gift from God is not enough to save people and we see Peter and John preaching it's the proclamation of the name of Jesus to this crowd that gathers because of the power that's displayed in the healing of the lame beggar and it is not earthly wisdom or knowledge that brings salvation to over 3,000 families, 3,000 men and their families. It is the power and the preaching through the Holy Spirit, God the Holy Spirit. And brothers and sisters, that's the only way we're going to do anything for God, then and now. He is the engine of the church. He is the power of the church. He is the provision of the church. God the Holy Spirit, then and now, the same. There's no change in how God operates. This is how it works. And if we try to do it any other way, and if we depend on anything else, we will fail miserably. We will fail miserably. So it must be this way.
And then we have seen the victory of Jesus in the life of his disciples and through us through the persecution that rises against them and Peter and John boldly stand for God before the council. Brothers and sisters, to stand before a large crowd that has power over your life and not shrink back in fear and not get bitter and not fight back is going to take more than what you and I have. It is going to take the power of the Holy Spirit when opposition comes against us. Jesus says go and he keeps every promise he makes and he will equip and empower and accompany you when you say, yes, God, I will live for you. Yes, God, I am going to raise my family in a godly way. Parents, I'll tell you something. I pray for you and I'm, gonna, and I'm going to pray for you more. When you are trying to bring up your children in a godly way, Husbands and wives, when you're trying to live a godly, in a godly and committed relationship, when everything around you is pulling your relationship and your marriage apart, and parents, when everything around you is pushing your children to let them come up in a different way, different values that are not of God, it's going to take the presence and the power and the equipping of the Holy Spirit. Oh my goodness! Some of you may feel like, well, I'm not really called to ministry or this or that. I want to tell you something this morning. If you are a parent, you have one of the biggest ministries in the world, one of the most precious and one of the most valuable. You have brought, you and your, and your partner, your husband or your wife, you have brought an eternal soul into this world. And that child will live forever and it rests of course when they get older they have to make decisions but I want to tell you something this morning if you're here working in Hong Kong and your children are somewhere else or if your children are here with you though that though your children will have to make their own decisions to follow the Lord you are their parents you are the mother you are their fathers the fathers and it rests upon you whether on your shoulders, whether they in the years to come and in eternity will be in heaven or be in hell. It's going to take the work of the Holy Spirit, the equipping of the Holy Spirit. I know in this church this morning, there are many of us who have no flesh and blood children from our bodies. But praise the Lord, for the privilege that those of us have to carry on our hearts those children and people that have no Christians praying for them, that have no godly influence, that feel on their own in this world. So those of you that say, I wish I had children and I don't, instead say, God, open my eyes to those that have no godly in influence and that have no Christian parents that I might pray for them. I will carry them on my heart. I will carry them in prayer. That's what I do because I have no flesh and blood children of my own. That's, that's one of my prayers as a spiritual parent. As a spiritual parent. And it can be yours as well. Amen? Amen. 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 This is true. This is true. And as you go into the world, and as you are Christian parents, and as you live in this world, and as you work in this world, when you say, God, I will live for you. God, I will speak for you. God, I will love for you. God, I will work for you. God says, I am with you. I will not leave you. I will not forsake you. I will empower you with my Holy Spirit and you will make it through. You will do everything I've called you to do. Your children will grow up knowing me, following me, loving me, and serving me. Parents, you commit to pray for your children. I know you get frustrated with them sometimes. I know sometimes they just make you mad, don't they? You get so, don't give up on them. You keep praying. And if they're not Christians yet, and they're this way and they're that way, you keep on praying. Don't give up. Don't give up. Keep on walking and keep on lifting them to the Lord. Now, let's move forward. 
So here, are that was your, that was our, uh, that was our overview intro as we come to the end today. So let's move forward this morning. When we left Peter and John last week, they were, they, the Sanhedrin had confronted them, and Peter and John, they had confronted them with this dilemma, if you will. Okay, and the dilemma was Jesus had told them what? Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature, baptizing them, making disciples, and I'm with you always. That's what Jesus had told them, right? What does the Sanhedrin tell them? The Sanhedrin says, let's look, next slide, Acts 4, 18 through 20. They call them back in. Don't you ever speak or teach in the name of Jesus again, ever. Here's the dilemma. Man says this, and he's really powerful right now. God has said something else. God's up in heaven, and they can't see him anymore. What are the disciples going to do? We already know. As we say in America, duh. You know, when somebody asks a foolish question, you, you say, duh. Okay, it's an easy answer because they have the words of Jesus burning in their hearts. They have the empowering of the Holy Spirit, and the answer is easy. The answer is easy. And so the answer is, do you think God wants us to obey you rather than Him? We cannot stop telling about everything we have seen and heard. There's the personal witness again. Brothers and sisters, when you have the Word of God in your heart, and when you have the equipping and the empowering of the Holy Spirit, that is when you can so much more easily say when there's a conflict, duh, <laughs> it's true. Duh, of course, I'm going to obey God rather than man. But I want to tell you something. If you don't have the Word of God strongly in your heart, and you don't really have the power of the Holy Spirit filling you, and that comes through re relationship with Him and walking with Him, you're going to face this conflict, this dilemma, and it's going to be hard. It's, it is. It's going to be hard. Do you know what I mean? Yes or no? Yes. yes. Are you awake this morning? Yes. Well, okay, I'm just checking, just making sure. Jean's awake. Thank you, Jean. <laughs> it, it will be hard if you are, if you're not in the same place. You say, well, I'm not a disciple. I'm not one of the apostles. No, but we are children of God and we're disciples of God. And listen, listen. Brothers and sisters, you and I have the same availability of God's power and provision that they have. We do. We do. But we walk into relationship with the Lord. And so the, the answer is easy. And I want to, as I was thinking about this, I was reading some notes and I thought, ouch, Lord, that's true. Compare the early disciples with so many disciples today. The early disciples, so full of Jesus and His words and the power of the Holy Spirit, they had to be commanded, don't ever speak again about Jesus. Sadly, unfortunately, so many Christians today have to be commanded to do what? Speak, speak right? Come on, how many of you? I'm, not gonna, I'm just going to let my life be my testimony. <laughs> We do that so often, don't we? And our lives should be our testimony. But it's our lives and our words and the power of the Holy Spirit. May we be just as they are. That truly, that, that, it, we, that if we're in a situation, people have to, you have to stop talking about Jesus. And our response will be, duh. <laughs> okay, duh. As for us, we cannot. We cannot. And you say, but I didn't see, I didn't, I didn't see the same things the disciples saw. Oh, yes, you have. You have seen your own life. You were dead. You were dead. Yes. And now you're alive. You were crippled with sin all your life. And now you are whole and free and you walk in the Lord. Amen? Amen? So what you have seen and heard is the same thing that they have. And so that's the response. So what can they do? We look at the next one, the next slide. What can they do? Very little. Brothers and sisters, I'll tell you what. If you are determined to really live for God and do what God tells you to do, do you know what? There's very little that, the op that opposition can do to you. Really. When you have said, God, I'm yours, my life is yours, and that's it. 
I'm, I'm yours all the way. I'll tell you right now, you may be threatened, you may be this, you may be that, but there's not a lot that can be done against the child of God who says, God, I'm yours. God, I'm for you. So they threaten them again one more time, right? Like that's going to do any good at all. But that's, that's the only tool they have. That's the only power they have at this point. And so they threaten them again. They didn't know how to punish them for everyone is praising God. Everyone is praising God. Amen and amen. Now, what's going to happen next? Some of you did your homework, so you already read uh, in the, the following verses, right? Let's see what happens next. And I want to ask you, okay, here we go. Acts 4.23. And I want you to see what they did, and then I want us to think about ourselves just a minute. Because, honestly, brothers and sisters, here are Peter and John, the disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ, doing good deeds in the power of the Holy Spirit, doing exactly what Jesus has told them to do, and what happens to them? They get persecuted. They get arrested, thrown into jail, and then accused before the Sanhedrin, and by the way, if you will read chapter 5, you will see a P.S. to this story. Don't read it now. But you will see that something very similar happens just a little bit later with a different, uh, with a different outcome. A, a different outcome. They are going to be flogged. They're going to be punished. But you'll see more about that. You read it on your own in chapter 5. But I want us to look at this and I want us to think about human nature just a minute. Because we've talked about this before and I want to just stress this. It would have been so easy for Peter and John to have blamed God. God, how could you let this happen to me? Let me ask you something. How many of you, bad things have happened to you at times and, and you wanted to blame God and maybe you did blame God? Don't raise your hands. <laughs> Thank you, Louisa and Cindy. They raised their hands very quickly. <laughs> it, it's human nature, isn't it? You want to blame God and you feel like, God, this isn't fair. Look at me. I've given you my whole life and persecution has come to me. And I have known so many people as a pastor, and so have you, who have faced hard times, yeah? And when they face hard times, do you know what happens? They leave the church. Yes or no? Yes. Yes. They leave the church. They blame God. They get disappointed with God, with people, and they go off somewhere, and they're mad at God. And they're mad at God for a long, long time. And we know people like that. I want to tell you something this morning. That heart and that attitude is not of God. Now, I'm not condemning people that have done that right now, because I'm talking to us this morning. So this is for you and for me this morning. Watch your heart. Guard your heart. When tough times come, when opposition comes, when difficulties come and things happen, guard your heart that that is not what fills your heart or starts creeping in. Instead, let your heart and your attitude be like theirs. As soon as they were freed, they returned to the other believers and told them what the leading priests and elders had said. They don't gossip. They don't complain. They don't whine. Do you know what they do? I see it this way. They run to their family. That's what they do. They run to their family. Brothers and sisters, when you face trouble, when you face opposition, run to your family. Run to your family. And I'm not talking about your earthly family unless your earthly family is a godly Christian family that's serving the Lord. When you face opposition and when difficulties come, you run to the family of God that He has given you wherever you are. Some of you are here in Hong Kong long term or this is your church home. Some of you are here temporarily and you will go on to other countries or other places. Wherever you are, you pray and you get plugged into a church family where it is your family. Don't be a nomad. Don't be a guest. Don't be a visitor from church to church to church to church. I'm not saying that various churches, they can bless and they can bring in where a lot of, uh, maybe some of us have other Bible studies and things like that. I don't mean that. But there should be a place where you have a church family and a church home, not because I said so and I'm the pastor, not because Pastor Renee says so, but because God puts His children into families. And families are the church. And they're not perfect. 
So go ahead and just say, they're not perfect. They've got warts. They've got problems. But Lord, this is the church family that you've brought me into. And when you are part of a church family and hard times come, don't run away. Don't isolate yourself. Don't pull back. Instead, run to the church family. Run to the church family. Because in the church family, you will be supported. You will be prayed for. You will be loved. You will be helped. You will be healed. You will be prayed for. And you will be restored. That is what the church family does. And for those of us, I want to tell us the rest of us something right now. If we're all doing okay this morning, when your brothers and sisters stumble and fall, don't push them down further. Don't point fingers. Pray for them. Reach out to them. Call them. Love them. Bring them back in to the family of God. That's how we're supposed to do it. For me and my earthly family, earthly family, and it's not a perfect family, I know that when something's wrong and something's bad, I can call my family. I can call my sister. I can call my mom and dad. That's an earthly example. And I know that in that family, I am loved and I'm accepted. My brother this morning is so far out there. And you all know that, those of you that know my brother. So far from God. You pro some of you wouldn't even recognize him if you could see him or you knew about his lifestyle. And yet, he is loved in the Nolan family. Why? Because he's a Nolan. It's family. That's an earthly example, and I'm not pr trying to praise my family. That's an imperfect er earthly example of the church of God and the family of God where people should be loved. Now, the Bible gives us guidelines about how to do it. The Bible does. But that should be, that's how you and I are to function. Amen? So Peter and John go to them. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we have to finish this morning. And so they go. As, as we think about this, I want to tell you something that has blessed me so much. And I want to say something as well. Something that has blessed me so much is the Viber prayer group and the What's Up prayer group that we have right now. And if you say, huh? What is that? I don't know what that is. You come see me and we'll make you part of the prayer groups of Lighthouse, okay? You just to have, have to have a smartphone and I, we're in Hong Kong. Everybody has a smartphone, right? And if you'd like to be part and you say, I have prayer requests and I will pray, we can put you in to a prayer group. And what has blessed me so much when Julie was sick, with this, this urgent, and, and throughout the, throughout, oh, so long. We were in, in Philippines, and we got, the, we got the message about Julie and the problem with her kidneys that was so urgent and, and very, and really life-threatening. And we started praying there, and so did you all as well. And then, and then Juliet asking for her uncle, for her auntie as well, who is, who has Ebola in Sierra Leone. Please pray for my auntie. And what happened? Immediately, praying, 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 praying. And then Marianne, I, lo I love her. Marianne brings words, of brings words of encouragement and messages from the Lord as the Lord leads. And that is how the family of God, and Christine as, as well, and, and, and so many of us, that's how it works. And that's how it's supposed to work. And that's what Peter and John do. So they run to the family. They run to the family. And then what happens? Let's look at the next one. And this comes to our final point this morning. Oh, they pray. Nobody has to tell them to pray. Nobody has to say, this is how you're going to do it. Why? There's a need. They are children of God. The Holy Spirit is in them. And let me tell you what the Holy Spirit will do, brothers and sisters. When the Holy Spirit's working in you, the Holy Spirit will pull you to prayer. It will. He will. The Holy Spirit will pull you to prayer. And that's why you want to stay full of the Holy Spirit and open to God the Holy Spirit's work in your life because He will pull you to prayer in the times of need. And oh boy, is this a prayer meeting. Now, I want to ask you something. Honest, and I'll be honest as well. How many of you have ever, in your lifetime, as a Christian or, or not, have you ever been in a prayer meeting and you fell asleep in the prayer meeting? Raise your hands. Come on. Thank you, DJ. Pastor Renny, never? Ah. I'm raising my hand because I've fallen asleep before. 
of course, when I was much, much younger, you know. Brothers and sisters, do you know sometimes when we pray together, do you notice that I often walk around as I pray? Have you noticed that before when we have prayer meetings? I'll often walk. I do that not, I just do that to keep alert physically. Thank you, Brother Hans. He raised his hand, okay? He did. I do that just to keep alert physically because you know what the Bible says? The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak, right? So we we all struggle. Or you, you're praying and you don't fall asleep, but you have red hand marks all over your face <laughs> from doing that. We all have. Oh, but brothers and sisters, here's a prayer meeting where nobody falls asleep, right? Nobody gets bored. Nobody leaves early because i got to go now. Everybody's there. Let's see what happens next. Here's the prayer. And it's kind of long, and we're not going to... I know that's a little bit long, but just kind of look at it. And then I want us to compare our prayer to this prayer, because I think when we look at this, you and I would say, I don't pray like this. Look at that language. It's so whatever. And so I want us to look at some things as we come to our, our, the, our conclusion this morning. I want us to look at some things that will help us in our praying this morning as we look at how they prayed. And I'm not going to read all of it, but if you look at this section, this section is a list of all the enemies, okay? Right down here, the enemies of Jesus, okay? Got that? But make sure you read what they say about this, because this is what happened to Jesus, okay? But then you'll look at this first part and just take a look at it. When they heard the report, uh, let me ask you something. The Bible, this is where we have to use our brains. The Bible does not tell us that all the other believers were praying, but I want to ask you something. Do you think, while Peter and John were arrested before the Sanhedrin, what do you think the other believers in Jerusalem were doing? Praying. Had to have been, I think. I think there's no question. Gathered in prayer, right? Because Peter and John go back and they tell them. And then so they tell, give them the report. What is the response of the church and this is to be our response brothers and sisters their response is not oh no what shall we do their response is not oh we better scatter because they're gonna come and get us too their response is not yeah, 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 against the authority or the government that's in power what do they do what do they do pray. boom they pray they pray Here's the response, brothers and sisters, that they had, that we're supposed to have too. And then how do they pray? So let's look at how they pray. When they heard the report, all the believers lifted their voice together in prayer to God. So what does that mean? It probably means that all of them were praying and then at some point, one of them lifted up his voice over everybody else and prayed and everybody else agreed in prayer. That's probably what that means because God is a God of order. And there are times where there's all, everybody is praying, lifting their voices, and then there are times when God leads one to lead everybody in prayer. So that's probably what happened. What do they pray? Look at this. I've never prayed this way before, but I'm gonna start. O oh, Sovereign Lord, Creator of heaven and earth, the sea and everything in them, you spoke long ago by the Holy Spirit. Oh, Holy Spirit's in the Old Testament? Yes, Holy Spirit's in the Old Testament. Through our ancestor David, your servant, saying, Why were the nations so angry? Why did they waste their time with futile plans? The kings of the earth prepared for battle. The rulers gathered together against the Lord and against His Messiah. Jesus is in the, in the Old Testament? Yes, Jesus is in the Old Testament. So here we see this prayer, and then we'll get to the part. First of all, what I want us to do is look at just this part right here, okay? Take a look at this. Now, look at the next slide, okay? And I want you to see something. Ah, how did that prayer begin? It's from Psalm 146, verse 6. It's also from Isaiah, and it's also in Genesis, okay? But it's directly taken from Psalms 146. He made heaven and earth, the sea, and everything in them. And then there's our favorite part. What does that say? Keeps every promise forever. Other Bible translations say He is faithful. It means the same thing. There, and then remember the second part of the prayer? Psalm 2. Why are the nations so angry? Waste their time. The kings of the earth. Exactly. So what do I want us to see? Do you see that? That's from Psalms 2, verses 1 and 2. Okay, Psalms 2, 1 and 2. And this is Psalm 146, verse 6. What I want us to see is this this morning. And grab this from what's happening in this story. Their prayers are full of the Word of God. 
There's a point for us, okay? Their prayer is full of the Word of God. As they did, so too can we do. Their praying was solidly based on the Word of God. The Word of God and prayer always go together. In His Word, God speaks to us and tells us what He wants to do and what He's going to do. In our, as we speak to Him in prayer, we make ourselves available to Him for Him to accomplish His purposes in us and through us. Yeah? Okay. So in His Word, God's... Now, can God always speak to us and refresh a word in our hearts? Of course He can, and He does. God the Holy Spirit is not limited by time or to what is on the written page, but He breathes life into the Word of God so that we... Oh, God, this is what you're doing. And brothers and sisters, when our prayers are full of the Word of God, they are prayers that will stand. There are prayers where our feelings won't be in charge, but God's Word will be in charge of our lives. And so their praying is, when God's Word fills our hearts and thoughts, God's Word will fill our prayers, and our prayers will have substance and confidence, and with boldness, we will pray. And I want it so we see that. So number one, they, um, their, their, their prayer is filled with the Word of God. Okay, what else do we see as we look at that? Uh, go... To uh, go to slide, go on to the next slide as well. Okay, so then we, when we see that, what else happens? They lifted their voices together in prayer to God. Uh, some of your translations say in one accord, right? In one accord or something else. So what do else do we see about prayer as they call to God? Their prayer is in harmony and unity. And brothers and sisters, when we pray in harmony and unity of purpose. And when we pray in harmony and unity with our brothers and sisters, there is power in prayer. You want to kill prayer? Have a grudge against a brother or a sister. You want to have no feeling for prayer? Be at odds with your husband or your wife. Husbands, wives, let me ask you something. How much do you feel like praying on Sunday morning if you've just had a big argument with your partner? <laughs> yes? No. No. And I, I'm not, I know things happen. I know things happen. Do you know, Betty, things used to happen with Betty and me. We'd have disagreements and whatever, and we always knew we got to work it out. We've got to talk it out. We've got to forgive, and we've got to keep going. Disunity and disharmony and holding grudges against your brothers or your sisters will ruin your prayers. It will there, God will not flow and God will not work. Our prayers must be, we must have right relationship with the brothers and sisters and with God. And so they pray in unity and in power. Then what else do we see? We see, and I want you to see, that. sorry, back up just one more time. And I want you to see this. Look at this overall, and to me this is one of the, so important. They see their circumstances in the light of God's Word. Let me say that one more time. They see their circumstances in the light of God's Word. If you don't see your circumstances in the light of God's Word, it will be very difficult to pray, and it will be very difficult to stand. But when you see your circumstances in God's Word. And this is how God sees it. And this is how God works. It will help you. It will keep you going. And you'll be able to pray. If not, you'll just be this way and that way. So, because they see... And how can I say that? I can say that because... And you say, well, Pastor Jennifer, where exactly do you see that? Uh, by the way, I'm going to go just a few more minutes, but it will be... Look at verse 28. But everything they did was determined beforehand according to your will. Do you see that? Because they see that everything that happened was in the light of God's word and God's will. They had peace. And when you know that your circumstances are in God's hands, in the light of His Word, you can have peace. I don't care if hell is, flo is burning around you. I don't care if war has erupted around you. You can have peace through it when you see your circumstances in the light of God's Word. Now let me show you one other thing here. They raised their voices together in prayer, and what did they say? What does that say? Oh, sovereign, oh, sovereign Lord. When they say that, let me tell you something. That is that phrase for God is only used total five times in the New Testament. Only five times. Okay? Now, why do they say that and what does that mean? 
In English, we have a word that is a very, actually a negative word usually, and it means a despot. Do you know what a despot is? It means this powerful ruler controlling everything. And the English word despot comes from the same word as this. And what it means is, in the Greek, what it means is one who has absolute control and absolute power over everything. Over everything. Now, when we see God in that way, and when they prayed, Oh, Sovereign Lord! Ah! Oh, that speaks peace to their hearts and confidence to their hearts, doesn't it? Here's this Sanhedrin that says, you must never speak again. And they have power. And they've warned them and threatened them. What do the believers do instead? They call on the name of the Lord, but in this time they recognize, Oh, Lord, you are sovereign. And when we know that the Lord is sovereign in our lives and our circumstances and that He made the heaven, the earth, the sea, and everything in them, then when opposition comes, we can have peace and we can stand. When a health report comes that seems I'm going to die, it's cancer, it's this or it's that. Does God bring healing? Yes, there are times when God brings healing. Does God always heal? No. And we've seen, we've seen that. We see it in the Bible and we see it. And so we see this. And when these things come, so the health report comes. Or the economy crashes. Or families fall apart. Or we lose our jobs. Or it seems that every door and our future is closed. Or it seems that we are despised and rejected and laughed at on all sides. That is when, brothers and sisters, you need to lift your heart your voice and your eyes to the Sovereign Lord who is the creator of everything. It's all in His hands. It all comes through Him. And when we recognize that and when we pray that and when that flows through our lives, then we can have peace and we can say, Oh God, You are in control. Oh God, you are guarding my life. You are leading my life. I'm not on my own. The devil hasn't suddenly grabbed me and I'm in his power. That is why we must know him as, oh, sovereign Lord. And that's how they pray. That's how they pray. And so we see slide 10, next, the next one. Powerful and effective praying. What's the first one? The Word of God fills your prayers. Fills your prayers. Secondly, Pray in unity and harmony. If you've got something in your heart to get somebody, go get it right. Get it right. For your sake. You say, but they're whatever. Forget whether they're right or wrong. Let your heart be right. Let your heart be right. That's all you're responsible for. And then finally, what do we see? See your circumstances in the light of God's Word. Oh, Sovereign Lord. Oh, Sovereign Lord. And then they pray as we come Oh boy, this is not the conclusion. <laughs> we have to stop. But let's stop with this. <laughs> it's time to stop. When I come back from America in December, <laughs> I will finish this sermon. <laughs> but this is a good place to stop, right? This is a good place to stop. Because then, right up to now, they haven't asked for anything, have they? Have they asked for anything yet? No. But they're going to. Do you think they're going to ask, God, smite our enemies? We want to do that, don't we? God, show them they're wrong. They're going to ask for something, and God's going to answer. But that was long ago. And this is now. So brothers and sisters, as we close this morning, I encourage you, I challenge you, and I promise in the second service, I won't go any further in the second service than I've gone in the first service. I'll stop, I'll stop right there. I'll stop right there. But I encourage you, I encourage you, wherever you are this morning in your Christian life, I'm going to pray for you right now. Amen? And as I pray,